Hello everyone and welcome to the first stages of our journey into the discoveries at Sutton Hoo and the fascinating story, the burial rites, the settlements of early Anglo-Saxon England. These were displays of wealth and power that prepared them for the afterlife. Equally imposing were the great halls they constructed, their royal power bases. Time Team has excavated the remains of several Anglo-Saxon structures over the years, most memorably the Colossal Hall at Sutton Court near Oxfordshire, available to watch now on the Time Team Classics YouTube channel. As Mick used to say, it's a cracker. I caught up with Professor Helena Hamero, an authority on Anglo-Saxon archaeology, to share her memories of the dig and thoughts on this enigmatic age. This includes insights on Sutton Hoo, the Staffordshire Horde, and an intriguing period of British history when women like St Hilda wielded a significant degree of power and influence as abbesses of large estates. Helena also suggested the site that she would like Time Team to investigate, one that has special significance to Time Team's own origins. Could it be one of our next dig sites? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and I hope you enjoy this interview with Helena and the information that it will pass on to you. I found it particularly fascinating and a great pleasure to carry out. What what's your your feelings as a? I mean, I think of you as a. I, I I'm not sure whether it's true to say an academic archaeologist because I know you do lots of digging and things. What's your feeling about uh, these reconstruct big reconstruction projects like the Sutton Hoo ship? What what are you hoping to learn from it? Well, I mean, I think as with all these things, you learn both from the process of creating something like that, all the difficulties, all the things you never thought of until you actually tried to, as it were, make one. <laughs> and then there is what do you learn once it's actually complete and in use. So in a sense, you know, we don't know what we don't know and all sorts of things uh, will, will emerge in questions. I mean, when, when I talked to Martin about this not too long ago, we started talking about how given the shape of the boat, you know, how all the oars would be different lengths. And so the rowers, you know, the experience of rowing something like that would be completely different from, you know, let's say rowing an eight, you know, how would you learn to do that? So all, all those sorts of things, not just the technical detail, but I guess the human detail. You'll be glad to know we volunteered Helen as a trainee <laughs> rower, um, but she has got a family tradition of it and she's taking to it, um, well, we're hoping she's taking to it very well. So we're going to have her learning some of the difficulties and challenging uh, challenges of, of the rowing world. Um, let's, just, uh, let's just have a little think, um, if we can. What, what's your memories of Sutton Courtney? I've got the report with me here. And um, I have rather nice memories of Sutton Courtney the, the, with some traditional, what I think of as Anglo-Saxon complications, um, you know, a slight lack of fines. Um, but as Helen used to keep reminding me, our great hall, as we think of it, your great hall, our great hall, is nine centimetres longer than Yevering. And uh, I, I, I think we, 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 we count every one of those centimetres. So, um, but what, what are your memories of the shoot and how did you feel about it working with Time Team again? Well, you know, it was incredibly exciting because it was a site that I suppose I'd been aware of since I was a student. And, you know, at the time rather naively thought, well, goodness sake, there's such an important site so close to Oxford and no one's really excavated there since the 1930s. Well, you know, we should really, you know, but without any awareness of all the cost and complications and so on. So it was, a, it was hugely exciting to realize that finally, uh, all those decades later after E.T. Leeds first uh, excavated there, it was finally gonna be possible to look at the site um, afresh with you know much more knowledge about what was there you know from the crop marks and so on and to be you know quite targeted about it and while on the one hand you know we know these sites are incredibly rare thanks to 
um, a little bit of field work we'd done a few years earlier. And thanks to the, the crop mark sites, you know, I was pretty confident that this really was going to prove to be a great whole complex. Uh, and so, you know, it, it was slightly less, you know, oh gosh, will we find anything? I mean, I thought, well, you know, it's gotta be, it's gotta be. But of course, again, until you're actually out there and, and, and you, you, you put, um, you know, shovels in the ground, you're never a hundred percent sure. Um, so it really produced the goods. And I, I, you know, it's always nice when you have fines, but as we know from these sites, they just almost never do produce anything. Um, even Yevering, you know, the, the grape find was a tiny, tiny shred of gold from one of the post holes. I mean, that was about it. So, um, you know, and, and given the comparatively small scale of the interventions, I mean, I think it was just amazing how it, you know, the bang we got for our buck as it were. And how did you feel uh, about the kind of reconstruction at the end we attempted to do and, and um, we, had, we, you know, we used what evidence and the amazing fact that the post holes, you could see the slope. I mean, that was astonishing for me to see the angle of the posts. Yes, it came out beautifully clearly, actually, didn't it? Um, no, it was fantastic. And getting that reconstruction, I think, helps people appreciate just what an accomplishment, what a technical accomplishment these buildings were, how visually impressive they were, how, you know, in a landscape that otherwise, you know, pretty much lacked monumentality, the impact that a complex of buildings like that would have had on people living in that area. You know, the problem is it was a wooden world. None of these structures remain. They're just holes in the ground. So we tend to rather dismiss this period, you know, the Dark Ages and all that. Uh, and then you look at Charlemagne's palaces in stone, you think, wow, aren't those amazing? But actually something just as amazing was being, you know, built here, not just the churches in the seventh century, you know, stone churches are very impressive, of course, but these, you know, enormous complexes of timber buildings, you know, which no trace survives. And it's really only through that kind of excavation and reconstruction, if you like reimagining, that we can ever hope to get close to what that experience would have been like of coming upon a complex of buildings like that, you know, out there in the landscape. I always rather hoped at some point or other, as you know, we did um, see Henge with Damien Goodburn. And, you know, essentially if any archeologists and filmmakers are thinking of reconstructing something, Damien is one of those people that, um, you know, you, you tend to talk to. And I remember when we reconstructed a sea henge with Francis Breyer, that because he did it so accurately with the correct trees, the correct bindings, everything that he threw into it, it did seem that we actually went into that structure. It had a real feel of something. It, it sort of communicated itself to everybody, um, not just old hippies like me, but you know, people with a quite scientific bent said when you stand inside this reconstruction you feel something have, have you has anybody ever reconstructed an anglo-saxon hall that you've been able to go in and, and enjoyed and felt this was what it would have been like well it's funny you should say that because uh, a few years after the sutton courtney excavations it was finally possible to conduct a very small excavation at long whitnam just a few miles to the east, where aerial photographs suggested that there might be another, albeit somewhat smaller, uh, Great Hall complex. Uh, and although we weren't able to um, get into the field with the largest of the buildings, which was probably 20 odd meters long, maybe a little bit more, we were able to excavate one of the smaller ones, about 12 meters long, very poorly preserved, not nearly as well preserved as the Sutton Courtney one. Um, but because uh, the landowner is in fact a woodland charity and very interested in timber and in timber buildings, um, they managed to get a heritage lottery fund grant uh, with which um, the building was in fact re reconstructed more or less on the footprint of the original. Now it's much smaller, as I say, than the you know, half the size of the Sutton uh, Courtney uh, Great Hall, even slightly less than that. But seeing that go up as it were in real time, entering that space in kind of 3D 
is a really re remarkable experience. Um, when you then think of all we've lost in terms of the finish of these buildings, that the interiors almost certainly would have been finished in special ways that, you know, the average, uh, you know, house just wouldn't have been. The flooring would have been special. You know, there was there were hints at Sutton Courtney of, of a kind of white plaster, sort of lime plaster on the building. And that's before you start thinking about things like wall hangings and so on. And you just think these spaces must have been really a, a kind of you know, experience almost of sensory overload in, in, in that world um, of color and of different textures and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, so see that that, that that was really quite something. And, and we hope that over the years as resource becomes available, that various um, uh, societies or living history societies might actually make some of these kind of fittings and hangings and finishes so that you know, over time, you begin to get a feel of what that interior space was really like. Um, it, it's one of the um, sanguine things about, you know, my experience of Anglo-Saxon archaeology on Time Team is that we very much, you know, had to face um, the thing that you were talking about, which was effectively, you might have a wonderfully huge structure there, like Yevering, like Sutton Courtney, and yet the material in the trenches, in the post holes to help date it is, you know, desperately missing. Um, so that you end up having to call Sutton Courtney a middle Saxon hall, if you like. Um, and in dating terms, you know, that's probably, unless, you know, you, you've found more out recently, but I, I've always, it's always struck me that most Anglo-Saxon archeologists have to take a lot of interest in cemeteries you know, it's, it's, it's the place that you know you can go and find stuff. Whereas even if we go to massive great buildings, the size of cathedrals or relatively speaking, um, often there's so little finds, the organic material has just disappeared. Well, it's true. I mean, that said, I'm becoming increasingly convinced that all of these great halls were constructed during quite a narrow window of time. And I, I would put money on that Sutton Courtney Hall of been seventh century. Um, and as it happens, the Long Whitnam building, poorly preserved as it was, produced one thing, a little fragment of deer bone that was possible to date squarely to the middle decades of the seventh century. So it was, you know, there's more and more evidence to suggest that. So it's perfectly true that these sites are, are often disappointingly sort of clean. But, uh, you know, it's a different kind of challenge and you then have to find other ways of dating them and understanding them and investigating them. And, uh, you know, I think we understand more about them now than we could have imagined, you know, when I was a student. And it is one of the, one of the interesting uh, uh, ironies in the sense about the Sutton Who boat that we have, there was very little material there, no wood virtually that could be carbon dated. So we date Sutton Who from the golden coins, which uh, I think the latest um, French experts, because it comes from mints in the Frankish area, have, have put at about 625. Mm. Um, and you then, uh, you know, get the mysteries of that, because if you're talking Sutton Courtney at seventh century, Radwell dying, let's say 625, you're talking about a, a period of Anglo-Saxon history about which um, I am personally increasingly fascinated um, and uh, you've lived your life with it. How did you get started in Anglo-Saxon archaeology? What was, what was the thing that inspired you? And if you had some work to do from now on, where would you want to take your studies in Anglo-Saxon archaeology? What's the thing you want to most find out? Well, I guess what drew it to drew me to it in the first place is the fact that it kind of straddles prehistory and history. You know, of course, it's not really a prehistoric period, but if you're interested in how kind of ordinary people lived, how farmers went about farming and what, you know, to all intents and purposes, it is prehistoric. Um, so it's it, it, you kind of, uh, you know, have have some written sources or rather wonderful written sources of course at, at your disposal uh, but at the same time 
uh, there are so many things about which they say nothing, about which they're entirely silent. So you have this whole other world that can really only be explored through archaeology. And I found that really uh, appealing. I still find it really appealing. Um, and I guess in terms of what I think in the future is, is you know, really, really intriguing, something I'm, I'm working on now and I think would like to do more in the future, is this question of, of farming. It is, it is the period when the population of England you know, really recovers and begins to approximate uh, the population of Roman Britain and of the later Middle Ages. It's really when it when it recover when that population recovers. Well, it could only recover in that way because you know farmers were suddenly able to feed many more mouths than they could before. Well, how did they do that? Uh, and you know, a lot of people talk about open fields and the mobile plants, but the reality is we don't really know how they did that or how quickly they did that. Was that a was it a long drawn out thing? Was it a you know sometimes referred to as a revolution? So that's something I'm very interested in at the moment in, in using uh, bioarchaeological evidence to, to help us understand that. But the other thing is in fact, uh, the age of Sutton Hoo, or to be more precise, the immediately post Sutton Hoo age, because thanks to some recent work on the chronology of burial rites, it's become increasingly clear that not long after the Mound One burial, the shift, there was a shift in emphasis in burial display from a tiny number of super rich male burials with all the military gear, you know, the feasting equipment, the Sutton Hoo type of burial, to uh, in fact females. And I say female, not females, not women, because girls were included as well. So something suddenly happens in maybe the later 620s, 630s, where suddenly the interest now is in burying women and girls with stuff. Um, you know, and interestingly, that's the sort of time when, for example, you know, the famous royal women like St. Hilda and so on were, were children, if you like. So there's a kind of new generation, a new shift, uh, a new interest in what uh, women and girls are able to do for these leading families. And there's something about those burials. I think there's a very interesting story that those burials can tell us. Because although Bede, you know, says a lot about uh, th those royal women, we now have so many of these these quite richly furnished female burials. It clear, clearly wasn't just abbesses and royal women who were being given the special treatment. There's something there's something bigger going on. Uh, that again, I think only archaeology can can really truly help us understand. So that that's a direction I think we could we could profitably pursue in future. I think it's very interesting as well. I think Martin, uh, uh, Professor Martin Carver, who, who you know very well, and we've had the pleasure of working with recently, um, Martin um, refers to Radwell's Queen as possibly the person who designed the funeral in a sense, that maybe she made the choices, that somehow there was a, a force there who decided to select certain things for that burial. Um, because it's an interesting choice. And, and of course, B doesn't even give the woman a name, uh, unhelpfully. So when I'm talking to Sam Newton about her, he refers to her as Mrs. Radweld, which is not very helpful. Um, but you do get in the Anglo-Saxon, we've done some abbey sites where there seems to be a tradition in the later Anglo-Saxon period of these great women from the royal families going into institutions, not being shut away in a nunnery, if you like, but being a, an abbess of a huge institution with a great deal of power. And is, is that the sort of transition you're talking about? It, it absolutely is. And we see it in England, we see it in, in Francia too, in France, where, you know, women are uh, left the job, given the job of really running these huge wealthy family monasteries. Um, you know, the, the husbands and brothers and sons might be out there, um, you know, defending it against possible attack or against people who might want to take its lands, but it's the women who are actually running it. Uh, they're, they're governing, you know, what's going on in, in the monasteries. And so they have this, you know, relatively brief period in, in English history where they're incredibly prominent. And, and as I say, even man is to get into the written sources a bit. I mean, he may not mention Mrs. Radwald's name, but he certainly does tell us a lot about you know, people like Hilda and others. 
Um, and, you know, it's just such a fascinating question. What, what was it about that period that suddenly gave these women such prominence, such agency, which, you know, they then again lost eventually, but for, you know, 100, 150 years or so, they, they definitely um, had. And again, I, I think archaeology has a lot to add to that story. Um, Do you have a particular a favorite Anglo-Saxon queen or abbess from that period? Is there one person that, uh, that, that, that you, you, you would like to find more about or you followed in your studies or? Oh, I don't, well, you know, as an archeologist, I tend not to get too hung up on the individual as it were. It's more the sort of bigger picture, but one, one can't fail to be impressed by Hilda and what she achieved and you, 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 you know, be perhaps understandably doesn't dwell too much on the detail, but you know, he describes how she and a little band of religious women kind of travel the countryside, almost as sort of, you know, um, freelancers, you know, re religious specialists kind of, uh, doing all sorts of quite irregular things in terms of formal Christianity, but how clearly having just an enormous impact. Um, and, you know, I just think it's fascinating to, to think about how they came to do that and to, uh, you know, have the, uh, have the wherewithal to achieve those things, which she clearly, clearly did. And she was hugely respected and highly regarded. What date are we talking about with Hilda? About. Well, we're talking about, again, those, those middle decades of the seventh century. Um, I mean, she really, you know, the, the, these female led monasteries really start to take off, be founded in kind of the 660s, 670s, especially. Um, and we've also got the challenge for these people effectively. And uh, one of my favorite recent uh, stories with Sam and Martin was discussing Radwell's uh, joint um, church slash temple where he had both a Christian altar and a pagan altar which seems to be a wonderful metaphor for slightly hedging your bets in the mid seventh century um, and and that's a, another uh, thing I would like to get your thoughts on is is Rendlesham and the possibility in the Sutton Who landscape of there being a great hall like uh, like Sutton Courtney, like Yevering, one feels there should have been. Have you ever sort of discussed or speculated or had thoughts about where you think that's most likely to be? Well, I mean, in my mind, there was never any doubt that there must be a great hall complex in the vicinity of Sutton Hoo. Um, and, you know, again, be, leads us to think that that might be at or near Rendlesham. <laughs> Um, and, and indeed, together with quite possibly some sort of trading site, uh, Vicus, and and I think there's good evidence now that that's exactly what they've got. Um, and uh, you know, it's always very difficult to um, kind of guess where in the landscape that might be. You can look at field names and place names and that sort of thing, and maybe begin to piece something together. Um, but in the case of Rendlesham, of course, it's, it's, it's now well known, it was really metal detector finds that led archeologists to think, aha, <laughs> it must be around here somewhere. And now it, it really does, does look as though that's the case. I was rather thrilled. We, we were looking at an estate map a couple of weeks ago in which um, the modern field names, you could see what they originally called. And there's a group of names around the, I think it's to the east of Rendlesham, that have got Woden Hall or Wooden Hall or Hall Field or Hall Building. And, it, you know, purely suggestive and probably poetic and all the rest of it. But you, you get a feeling that it would be a fascinating subject. I think Chris Skull is working there with, with local community people in Rendlesham. So it's a very, very exciting project. Um, I wanted to um, ask you also, um, when we think of this early stage of, of Britain, the early stage of the Anglo-Saxons, um, Bede suggests various locations that, that the, these people came from. And um, one, of the, one of the potential homelands is Angelm. Um, and there has archeologically been some links made between Facet faceted carinated pottery, uh, 
that exists in both Anghelm and in the area of East Anglia. It, it, can you use archaeology to suggest that the people who eventually Radweld would become uh, the, the Brett Walder of, that our, does archaeology give us the chance to say these very early settlements are likely to have come from Angelm or other areas uh, of, of, the, of uh, the Nordic countries, the Germanic countries? Well, it's always, you know, the, the, the more you try to refine it to a specific region, you know, the trickier it becomes in the sense that, you know, it's not too difficult to, to kind of pick up a particular object and say, well, its closest parallels come from this little bit of northern Germany or that bit of southern Denmark, whatever. It's quite a big leap then <laughs> to say that the people who settled in this area all or mostly came from that region. Um, you know, those, those links and those objects can travel, of course, in many different ways, which I guess is why it is particularly interesting uh, and potentially helpful, although perhaps less so for Norfolk in particular, that there are new, all sorts of new ways of looking at the, the kind of biochemistry of the human remains from, from this and from other periods, and to be able to say, well, did this person grow up in the same region where they were buried? This is the uh, oxygen isotope. Element. Yes, oxygen and strontium together can be quite effective in narrowing down the different possibilities of where someone came from. Um, but what's increasingly clear from those studies, and I think from ancient DNA as well, is that people moved around a heck of a lot. <laughs> and that rather than seeing mobility as kind of something really exceptional that you know maybe a tiny elite or whatever might have done, you know, actually, people just did move around a lot, um, you know, within Britain, you know, across the North Sea and so on. Um, and so I think it's, it's uh, you know, using the material culture, which was all we had before, and, you know, now very helpful that's been supplemented by these other sorts of data. So, um, but I still think we need to be careful, given how much people moved around, to try and be too precise about linking that group of people in this bit of East Anglia to, you know, groups of people in Angeln or wherever it might be. And, and have you given much thought to the to the notion of the uh, Radwell's lineage, if you like, um, that um, Sutton, who interestingly appears to have quite a Swedish influence in the shield, possibly the helmet, the sword, um, and um, there's a there's a there's an indication of the woofer, if that's the correct way to pronounce it, the family that that where Radwell in a sense had some of his origins. There's a and there's a a, a, a character um, Sam talks about who's might even have some sort of Ostrogoth background to him, and then the Vandal background. Uh, and a, a recent paper came out that suggested that there are some early Vandal, uh, as in Vel Vendel and Valsgard being similar cemeteries. Is there an even earlier Germanic or Nordic influence in which you are beginning to find information from the burials that, that you know about? Well, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, what the written sources tell us in these sort of genealogies is the importance for these new rulers of anchoring their dynasties in the ancient past. You know, we go way back. We're descended from all these semi-mythical heroes from ancient times. And we're descended, by the way, from the gods as well. And oh, from, you know, from the Caesars too. So I think we have to be <laughs> slightly uh, careful, uh, uh, you know, about, about that. I mean, it, these, these families had a strong interest in associating themselves with this kind of um, heroic past. Um, I think it's, it's quite difficult from the burials to really say too much about that. And then, and then we start getting into ancient DNA, which is you know, incredibly complex. Um, but I think, I, I think it's becoming absolutely clear that the links between these different Northern Germanic regions were much more than just you know a tiny number of of war bands or whatever you know trundling around but there, there is something 
that's been going on, not just during the so-called migration period, but for an awfully long time of um, these peoples being in contact with each other, people may be going to um, fight in different regions, fight in the Roman army, then go back to Scandinavia, bringing new ideas and contacts and so on with them. Um, and uh, that we shouldn't, well, we should be less and less surprised by that really. And in, in a sense, the reconstruction of the Sutton Hoo boat um, might make us think a lot about the ships we haven't got, that that, that whole, um, North Sea connection, the Frisian Islands and upwards of a number of boats like the Snape boat making those crossings coming and going. Um, and Edward Gifford's work with Say Wolfing, which showed you he could pop round to Kent in a three or four hours with the tide in the right direction. There was a mobility there that we probably can't quite imagine. Absolutely. And of course, the thing that is so wonderful, but also so infuriating about archaeology is you never know what someone's going to find next week. And, you know, for years we said, aha, boat burial, 7th century, boat, early medieval boat burial. It happens in that little bit of Sweden and it happens in Southeast Suffolk. That tells us there's a special link. And then I guess about when was it 15 years ago, thereabouts, they found another boat burial, but this time in Northwest Germany in its fifth century. So. You know, we don't, in fact, know how widespread and how, how um, long lived or when, when this first started, this tradition of burying important individuals in boats. Um, so, so we, again, as always, need to be careful about being too specific about drawing these, these links. And who I knows, think, maybe, um, you know, next year someone will find a boat burial in, you know, the Netherlands or something. I think it's Barry in um, one of his books, Facing the Ocean, he, he refers to a burial at Altanabi. Um, I think it's near uh, Valsgaard and Wendel, and he shows an illustration. Um, and there is something very, uh, you know, um, this is just more of a poetic response to it really, that there's, there's the man laid there with his horse and his dog and a pig, there seems to be a lot of animals scattered around it, which I, I find so sort of slightly comforting, although doubtless a rather sad end for some of those animals. But um, to see that collection, you feel that there's something there that, that would have been of comfort and, and, and as a tradition would have had some continuity to it. Um, and so when you look at the materials, from what, what, what do you think Sutton Who, in terms of what's actually in the burial, is, is, that, is that the highest level we have in terms of richness, do you think, that we found so far anyway? Well, this is when we come in, inevitably to the Staffordshire Horde. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about Sutton Who Mount One, the, the ship burial, is when it was found, it was by far the most gold rich burial of that period that had been found. And so, you know, people said, look at all that gold, you know, it must be royal. But a few historians, I seem to remember James Campbell, maybe a few others, pointed out that if you look at the written sources, you know, that amount of gold is nothing. There's much more gold in circulation. You know, there's loads of gold in circulation. You know, that little belt buckle and a few coins, you know, it's nothing. Um, and of course, then, you know, we find the Staffordshire Horde where you've got, you know, much more gold kind of unceremoniously, it seems dumped into a hole in the ground and, and being ready for, for, being, for being melted down and reused. So I think, you know, what the, what the finds tell us is not, it's not really about wealth, it's about power. And it's telling us about power and how power is being constructed in the early seventh century in quite a kind of symbolic way. You know, it, it, it's telling us that this individual was a great giver of feasts. You know, he could throw great parties for his followers, for his war band. He was a military leader. He had, you know, he, he had great connections with the Romans and with, you know, leading, leading Roman figures. He had international connections, various kinds. Um, and, and by the way, he had access to gold as well. And that's, you know, pretty important. But it isn't the message that I think the people, Mrs. Redwald or whoever um, is sending is not look how rich this guy is. It is look at how powerful he is and that power derives not from 
gold per se or from wealth per se, but from from those kind of social, uh, you know, the sort of social capital he had, that that ability to attract and maintain a war band, that ability to to feast them lavishly and give them wonderful gifts and so on. That's what that's what's been communicated, I think, in the burial. Um, we always like to ask our guests on um, our time team chats. Um, if uh, two things really, if I was to give you time team to play with for a couple of weeks, you get the geophysics, obviously you get the team, you get Helen, you get Carenza, Stuart, John, uh, any number of experts you like. Uh, do you, have you had on the back of your shelf somewhere there a potential site that you think, oh, I would love to do some work there on that. And, and uh, would you like to share that with us? And, and finally, do you have any thoughts about maybe going back to Sutton Courtney and doing more of the Great Hall, if that was possible? Um, so where, where would you think about a potential site that you might like to take time to? Well, to take the second part of your question first, I would love to go back to Sutton Courtney. I mean, we were, you know, barely able to scratch the surface, really. We, be, we found little hints of of fenced enclosures, hints of all sorts of things that 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 it would be wonderful to uh, to explore, but in terms of something quite new, um, I guess I've always been. Many people have been intrigued by the nearby site of Dorchester on Thames, which was the royal centre, the religious centre of that whole region at the time that the Sutton Courtney Great Hall complex was standing. And yet nobody's ever quite identified or located the heart of, of, of Anglo-Saxon Dorchester on Thames. So, you know, really important, nationally important royal centre. It's got to be there somewhere, but where? And interestingly enough, Dorchester on Thames was the site of Time Team's pilot many, many years ago. We went back there and worked at Dorchester. And I wanted to get your thoughts on Dorchester is often referred to uh, in various documents as the place where there's evidence of the federati, that is evidence of soldiers in the employment of the Romans who were Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, because of the belt hanging archaeology and things like that. Where do you stand on that? Do you, do you think there is a, a hint there of evidence of a set of mercenaries, if you like, employed uh, in the late Roman period, who are, might be the people who eventually rebel and, and, and start the whole next stage of our history? Well, I think in a nutshell, yes, I, don't, I, I do find that quite plausible. And there were some recent finds in the Dyke Hills of Dorchester on Thames of, of human bone and, and another very fine late Roman belt set and a throwing ax. And both the date and the, the stable isotope work, you know, would be consistent with a fifth century individual, um, you know, being buried in this very unusual way, you know, in these big Iron Age earthworks. Uh, and, and he was not local and probably not British. And that shouldn't surprise us given what the late Roman army in Britain looked like. Um, but you can well imagine a kind of fusion of that sort of individual, maybe from Northern Germany, Scandinavia, who knows, and a local group of, of, of leading individuals, those from Dorchester on Thames themselves, local authorities of various kinds, kind of joining forces and creating something quite new, um, which then goes on to, you know, become this dynasty in, in, in the, of early Wessex uh, known as the Gavissa. I, I think they probably were a kind of hybrid. So I, I, I do think Dorchester would, would repay more work. And just so I can make my long list of things I'm going to need to give you for your particular dig on Dorchester and Thames, um, what are your targets then? If we're gonna, let's assume, yeah. maybe it's not a three day time team, maybe it's a bit longer, it's a huge subject. We're quite flexible about these things now, but um, what, what's on your list? You think it's a Royal Centre, is there a Royal Hall? Or what are the things that would help you make your case or, or tell us more about that site? Well, we know from, from B that it was a royal centre and a religious centre. Um, so somewhere in the seventh century, so somewhere there, there is 
a royal residence. There is a probably an early church and there are little tantalizing hints. Um, a building that was originally thought to be Iron Age has now been looked at again and recognized, no, no question about it. It's seventh century. There's only a little bit of it was excavated. It's part of a big seventh century building. You know, well, what about the rest of it? What else might be in that, that sort of area? We have a few coins, so slightly the early eighth century coins. Again, there's a hint that there's some sort of market activity going on. Um, almost certainly in the same sort of area. So it would be lovely to focus, to do some targeted investigation around those areas that seem to be kind of productive, but it's, um, it, it's, it's a little bit of a needle in a haystack. It is, it is tricky to know almost where to start. I have very fond memories of walking around the church outside with Mick when we went there and looking at some of the architectural changes that had taken place in the church and Mick pointing them out. So it's got, we have very fond memories for Dorchester. So maybe it would kind of be appropriate 25 years later um, uh, with help from you and, and, and some sort of guidance from how you want to plan the, the strategy and what we could deliver. Is there, is there a good scope for geophysics, do you think, which is often what we're led by? There's, there certainly is. I mean, obviously within the, the, the village itself, uh, it's, it's, it's tricky, but in, the, in quite a number of green spaces around it, first of all, some geophysics has already been done around the Dyke Hills, uh, but there are certainly more that could be done. And we have uh, hints of some interesting metal detector finds and other, other material. Uh, so I think uh, there's certainly more scope. It, it is a lovely place, of course, still has some nice pubs. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, a really rich early history that we still know surprisingly little about. Helena, absolutely lovely. I'm sticking that on my list uh, to do some research and talk further to you about. It's been wonderful talking to you. I think um, whenever um, we thought about doing Anglo-Saxon history. Uh, your name was always there. We must talk to Helena about this. And uh, it was always a joy working with you. I think you did a lovely job of combining uh, erudition with a certain joy for the subject, which um, uh, in archeology span is, is, I think, a really valuable skill. So thank you very much for joining us on uh, Time Team Tea Time. And uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully catching up perhaps at Dorchester at some point in the future and we can solve some of the, the problems you'd like solved. Thanks ever so much. It was a huge pleasure. Thanks. To ensure you catch all the latest updates, please do subscribe to this channel, follow us on social media, sign up to our newsletter and join us on Patreon.